boys, girls, and babes. Welcome back to the Jenea Talks Caps podcast. Okay, so uh, today I want to talk about something that is one of the great mysteries of this world, uh, and that is the NHL's Department of Player Safety. And I use the term safety uh, very loosely uh, for reasons which I will outline throughout this podcast episode. Um... So, uh, Capitals fans in particular are very familiar with the Department of Player Safety, uh, and the DOPS likely has Caps General Manager Brian McClellan on speed dial uh, as well, um, given you know that we have Tom Wilson on our team, uh, and over the course of Wilson's young career so far, uh, he has become sort of the poster boy, if you will, uh, for the DOPS. Um, their favorite whipping boy, basically, their favorite guy to make an example out of on hits which are deemed clean when carried out by any player not named Tom Wilson. Um, so, uh, we know them and their double standards very, very well. Uh, as Caps fans, we do not like the DOPS, uh, that goes without saying. Uh, but, uh, today I'm going to do my very best to take my bias out of it and to instead come at you with facts. Um, taking the bias out of it, uh, operating on facts, those are two things which the Department of Player Safety are very, very bad at, uh, miserable at, in fact. Um, so yes, uh, we are going to speak objectively on this matter as much as possible. Uh, It does become a bit difficult because when you're talking about things such as borderline hits, well, um, they are called borderline for a reason, um, and that reason is because they could go either way, uh, that is clean or dirty. Um, So a lot of it is subjective, uh, and that's part of the problem, um, but it is only part of the problem um, because you see, while a lot of these hits are subjective to us fans, uh, and fans of different teams will have, of course, a different opinion on whether certain hits or plays are clean or dirty, um, you know, depending perhaps on which team the offending player plays for a lot of the time. Um, But the Department of Player Safety is not there to be on the same level as us fans. No, Um, they are there to be objective, to be the voice of reason, uh, to bring a set of consistent definitions as to what makes a play dirty or not dirty. Uh, And that's the problem is that they are neither objective nor consistent, uh, nor do they bring any sort of a voice of reason to the table. Quite the opposite, actually. Um, In fact, if you ask me, I think the only thing which the Department of Player Safety is truly consistent at is being entirely unobjective in their decisions. Uh, And it is maddening at times. Uh, The discrepancy between punishments doled out to different players on different teams for the same types of hits and or plays is just one of many examples. Um, You know, Tom Wilson, of course, it's been well documented, uh, has the book thrown at him on the regular by the Department of Player Safety. Uh, Most of the time for hits that the DOPS sees no issue with when any player not named Tom Wilson commits them. Um, So of course, you know, I'm using Tom Wilson as an example because all Caps fans are familiar. Um, And you know, while a player's disciplinary history is supposed to be a factor when deciding upon the length of a suspension, it is not supposed to be a factor in deciding whether or not to suspend in the first place. If a hit or a play is deemed to be worthy of a suspension, then it's at that point where you're supposed to look at a player's history of supplemental discipline and where his repeat offender status is supposed to come into play. Um, The DOPS is not supposed to factor in a player's history with them when they are still in the process of deciding whether or not a particular hit or play is worthy of a suspension to begin with. Um, Those are the rules, and yet they do not seem to hold true whenever the offender is Tom Wilson. So uh, that's very frustrating, uh, the fact that it's basically a free-for-all at the Department of Player Safety. Every time Tom Wilson is involved in anything, uh, he can't sneeze on a guy without, you know, getting a suspension these days. Um... Another great example uh, of the discrepancies taking place is what's taking place with Garnet Hathaway. Um, and again, I'm going to use this as an example because, of course, Caps fans are very familiar. Um, as you know, most of us, we watch all of the Caps games. So um, Hathaway, who has no history of suspension, who has zero history with the Department of Player Safety in general, uh, he was recently suspended for three games for spitting in the general direction of Anaheim Ducks defenseman Eric Goodbranson. Uh, now, for For some context, uh, in the same scrum, Hathaway was sucker-punched multiple times by Goodbranson while the officials held Hathaway in place and tied 
up his arms, allowing him no means of defending himself. Uh, so that was ridiculous to begin with. Um, and so after taking multiple sucker punches to his head, Hathaway finally let a loogie fly out of his mouth in the direction of Good Branson. Uh, and while it's a regrettable action, sure, I had talked about it, you know, in my in the previous episode here um, on Janae Talks Caps that, you know, I'm, I'm never condoning spitting at an opposing player. Um, and Hathaway admitted as much as well, saying that he does regret that he let that happen. Uh, it was certainly, however, not the first time that such a thing has occurred in the NHL, nor will it be the last. Uh, and yet it was the first time that someone has been suspended for it. So uh, you'll remember uh, one infamous example of course is uh, Boston Bruins forward Brad Marchand um, you know he has even gone so far as to lick lick with his tongue lick uh, then Toronto Maple Leafs forward Leo Komarov on the neck um, and then just a few short weeks after that he did the exact same thing to then Tampa Bay Lightning forward Ryan Callahan um, so Marchand um, you know, he, he received nothing in the way of supplemental discipline. Uh, the league did nothing. Um, so why then is Garnet Hathaway suspended? How is what Hathaway did any different than what Brad, Brad Marchand did? Um, the short answer is it's not any different. Um, you know, yet one player ends up with nothing and the other ends up with a multi-game suspension. Uh, which, by the way, is completely ridiculous. The fact that it's multiple games. Um, Hathaway, like I mentioned, is not a repeat offender. Uh, he had no prior history of suspension, and yet he's treated as if he is a repeat offender, while Brad Marchand, who is an actual repeat offender, gets off scot-free. Uh, it just makes absolutely zero sense, but hey, that's how the Department of Player Safety rolls. So, uh, it's three games to a first-time offender in Hathaway for hawking a loogie, uh, while meanwhile, uh, by the way, uh, many headshots and hits from behind still go either very lightly punished or in some cases not punished at all. Um, the Toronto Maple Leafs' Alexander Kerfoot, just over the weekend, uh, he made a crazy dangerous play uh, in which he cross-checked the Colorado Avalanche's Eric Johnson headfirst into the end boards from behind at full speed. Uh, Johnson miraculously was able to stay in the game. Um, thank goodness. Uh, he easily could have broken his neck on the play. Um, and this, uh, supposedly the exact type of dangerous, needless, stupid play that the NHL is attempting to make extinct. Well, it got Kerfoot a measly two game suspension. Um, Kerfoot uh, probably would have been suspended for longer had Johnson been seriously injured on the play, uh, which, you know, that in itself is a problem, and I'll talk about that a lot more a little bit later in this episode. Um, but for now, it's good to know that a blatantly dangerous play such as that is deemed by the NHL to be not as serious as hawking a loogie. It's a crazy world we live in. <laughs> Good times. Um, and in fact, uh, apparently hawking a loogie is more serious than a number of other offenses as well, uh, as Hathaway's three-game suspension is longer than what most guys get for a variety of hits from behind, headshots, flying elbows, cross-checks, etc., etc., etc. You could probably play for an original six team and actually pull a knife out of your skate boot mid-game and stab somebody on the opposition, and you would get less games than what Hathaway got for spitting. Um, but hey, that's none, none of my business. Um, by the way, perhaps the most hilarious and ridiculous note on Hathaway's suspension is the league's reasoning for giving him multiple games. Uh, the Department of Player Safety attempted to justify it by telling Hathaway that his action of spitting uh, was an, and I quote, intent to injure. That is, he apparently intended to injure Good Branson by spitting in his general direction. Um, I'm sorry, but what? Uh, what do you mean intent to injure? Like by spitting, intent to injure? Good Lord, what in the holy fuck are you talking about? How are you going to injure somebody by spitting at them? Maybe if it gets into their eye and they get pink eye? I don't know. Um, even then, even if that happened, intent to injure would mean that Hathaway would have intended for his spit to soar directly into Good Branson's eye and that he would have intended for him to get pink eye. So um, if that's true, then Hathaway is an evil mastermind. But, you know, um, hits from behind, head first into the end boards are apparently not an intent to injure. 
Okie dokie then. Uh, and speaking of over the weekend, uh, let's take a look at Robert Bortuzzo uh, because a play that he made against the Nashville Predators over the weekend has earned him a suspension. Uh, but while it's true that it has earned him a suspension, the suspension is laughably short when you take a look at what he did and then you factor in Bortuzzo's own history with the play in question, uh, which was an objectively dirty cross-check to Victor Arvidsson's back. Um, and that's the key here, uh, the fact that this play was objectively dirty, because like we've talked about, there's a lot of plays that happen in the sport that it's subjective whether it's dirty or not. Um, but this play by Bortuzzo was not subjective at all. It was 100% objectively dirty. Um, and the reasons why I say it was objectively dirty are really threefold. Um, number one, uh, there was a clear intent to injure, something that the Department of Player Safety harps on. Uh, yet again, uh, they only harp on it when it comes to certain players who play for certain teams. If you didn't see it, uh, Bortuzzo first cross-checked Arvidsson into the crossbar, uh, which is an extremely dangerous play to begin with. Um, but okay, let's, you know, for argument's sake, let's give Bortuzzo the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he didn't know that the crossbar was right there. I mean, it's totally in a different place in every game and in every period, right? Um, moves around. It's like, you know, just changes changes where it is all the time. It's never in the same place twice. Um, so maybe he didn't know where the crossbar was on the ice in this moment. Um, you know, it's not very likely, but we'll give him the benefit of the, of the, uh, of the doubt. Um, anyways, even if Bortuzzo just says that, you know, he lost his cool there for a minute and it wasn't premeditated to try and injure Arvidsson, uh, what he did next certainly was premeditated uh, as he had time to think about the action before actually carrying out the action. Um, yes, as Arvidsson was down on the ice after the first cross check, which again, the first one could have been in the heat of the moment, um, but the second one, Arvidsson is laying there helpless and with his back to Bortuzzo. Bortuzzo had time to think, and he chose, yes, chose to hammer Arvidsson in the back with yet another cross check. Um, and the reason why this play is so bad, so dangerous, so dirty is because everyone who has ever played hockey knows that the area where Bortuzzo chose to hit a defenseless Arvidsson, right in the lower back, just above the pants. Um, everyone knows that there is no padding there whatsoever. It's an exposed and vulnerable area uh, that is not covered by any sort of protective equipment. It hurts like a motherfucking B-I-T-C-H if you get hit there. Um, and, you know, you can really get hurt. Like, you can really get injured if you take a cross check there. And Bortuzzo obviously knows this and he chose to hammer it anyway um so you know he really had no care for Arvidsson as a human being at all on this play um the number two reason why it was objectively dirty is that uh you know in, in addition to the intent to injure um is that uh, there was no reason for the play other than that Bortuzzo was frustrated and pissed off that his blues were already losing two to nothing just a little bit over five minutes into the hockey game um, Arvidsson really did nothing to provoke this type of behavior from Bortuzzo. He really did nothing. Uh, Bortuzzo just kind of went off. Um, and the number three reason why it was objectively dirty is that Robert Bortuzzo is an objectively dirty player, uh, especially when it comes to cross checks into the backs of unsuspecting players. Yes, uh, this is not the first time that he has carried out such an act uh, as he made almost the exact same play against Brock Nelson of the New York Islanders two years ago, uh, hammering Nelson with multiple cross checks into his unprotected back as Nelson already lay unsuspecting and defenseless on the ice. Uh, Bortuzzo somehow inexplicably and indefensibly, I might add, uh, by the league, uh, was given just a fine for that incident, no suspension at all. Um, and Bortuzzo was also fined for yet another cross-check, uh, this time to then Boston Bruins forward Jordan Swartz's face. Uh, just last March, this one happened. Um, and again, it's completely 
you know, unjustifiable and indefensible by the league, uh, that a guy can make the same dangerous and dirty play three times on three separate occasions and against three different teams before he finally gets suspended for it once. Uh, It should not take three dangerous and dirty cross-checking incidents to equal one suspension. It just shouldn't. Um, Bortuzzo was also suspended three games, although two of them were preseason games, so that basically doesn't even count as punishment um, for elbowing Capitals defenseman Michael Kempney in the head in September of 2018. Uh, Again, it was during the preseason. Um, So Kempney ended up missing time with a concussion as a result of the hit, Um, but that's another thing, uh, another one of the many things that I wanted to talk about when it comes to the Department of Player Safety and the way that they operate um, is that in my not so humble opinion, any injury to a victimized player on any play which warrants supplemental discipline, uh, whether or not there's an injury that occurs and or the severity of that injury is not relevant to whether or not there should be supplemental discipline, nor is it relevant to how long the length of a suspension should be. It just doesn't make any sense to do things this way. Um, If a play is deserving of supplemental discipline, then it is still deserving of supplemental discipline, even if the victimized player happened to not be injured. Um, You know, when dirty players make dirty hits or dirty plays in general, and they happen to have the good fortune of nobody being injured, and so therefore they don't get anything more from the DOPS than the obligatory slap on the wrist, uh, then that's when that player begins to get comfortable with making these dirty hits or dirty plays because they get accustomed to not being reprimanded for it. And then guess what? Uh, The next time they do it, somebody does get injured, usually severely. Uh, And for a league that says that they want to get concussions and other types of head injuries out of the game, they sure do not act like it uh, because they let these guys who have consistently made these dirty types of hits and plays throughout their careers, they let these guys continue to run around with nothing resembling discipline coming their way until finally somebody gets injured. Uh, so shouldn't we be trying to stop it before it happens instead of waiting for it to happen before we worry about it at all? It's like we're waiting for somebody to get injured and then we'll do something. Um, Just doesn't make any sense. Uh, It's kind of the same thing that happens in horror movies, right? Um, You know, like when a woman's being stalked and the police are like, sorry, we can't help you until he kills you. Like, great. That's great. Thank you very much for your help. Um, This is the same thing. And when you look at Bertuzzo's case, it's a good example. Uh, He and dirty cross checks, like I mentioned, have a long history. Um, It's a play that, you know, he's consistently done throughout his career. Um, But the only discipline he'd ever received before for his previous two infractions amounts to nothing more than a slap on the wrist um, as he was fined. A total of $6,182.80 combined uh, for the two incidents. So that works out to $3,091.40 per incident. $3,091.40 for a guy who makes over a million bucks a year. Uh, that's not much of a price to pay, you know. I don't even think 3000 bucks would deter me from doing what I want to do, and I make much less than a million bucks a year, I can tell you that much. Uh, so it's just stupid. Um, it's stupid that the Department of Player Safety actually thinks that fines for this amount of money are going to be any type of a deterrent to a guy like Bortuzzo or to any NHL player. Um, and so now here we are, uh, Victor Arvidsson out at least four to six weeks with an upper body injury. Anyways, uh, on the flip side, I also don't think that the fact that uh, that there's an injury that occurs on a play um, and or the severity of that injury, uh, I don't think that that should be considered at all relevant to whether or not there should be supplemental discipline. It goes both ways um, because the thing is the same play, and I do mean the exact same play, uh, can have a very different outcome injury-wise depending on which player it's carried out against. Uh, for example, a headshot against a player with a history of concussions is likely going to have a far different outcome injury-wise than a headshot against a player with no history of concussions. Uh, Likewise, a hit that might cause Austin Matthews to miss a month and a half with a separated shoulder, uh, the same hit will not cause Alex Ovechkin to miss anything more than the rest of the shift that it happened on while they pop it back in uh, his shoulder, that is, and re-oil the steel and the titanium and whatever else it is that he's made of. Um, Russian machine never break. Uh, But the point is, uh, if a play is not deemed to be worthy of supplemental discipline when there is no injury, uh, then the same play should not suddenly be deemed suspension worthy just because somebody got injured. 
if it wasn't deserving of, of a suspension with no injury occurring, then it's still not deserving of a suspension when there is an injury that occurs. Uh, and I understand, of course, that uh, fans are going to be very upset and are going to be calling for the book to be thrown at a guy whenever one of their players gets injured, uh, particularly if that player is going to miss a significant amount of time. Uh, it is our job as fans to be irrational and fueled by emotion. Uh, but remember uh, that the uh, Department of Player Safety uh, is supposed to be the unbiased, objective voice of reason in these types of scenarios, uh, and they are doing just an absolutely terrible job at it, truly. Uh, seriously, they can't even follow their own rules, uh, many of which don't make sense to begin with. So it's basically just a steaming, jumbled pile of dog shit at this point. Um, anyways, uh, back to this specific point. Uh, in my opinion, the things which are relevant to any supplemental discipline being doled out are the act itself, uh, as well as if the offending player has any type of a history uh, as far as dirty and dangerous plays are concerned. Um, things that should not be made to be relevant and that should not be a factor in any supplemental discipline as far as I'm concerned. Uh, are whether or not there is an injury that occurs on the play and if there is an injury what the severity of that injury is and or how long is the victimized player going to be out of the lineup for etc these things are not relevant and should not be made to be relevant uh, by the clowns operating at the Department of Players Safety. Uh, it really is just a total circus when you choose to run things this way because there are just too many extenuating circumstances and too much left up to debate uh, when you're talking about handing out supplemental discipline. It should be black and white. It shouldn't be, you know, so-and-so um, made this hit and this guy got injured. You know, he's out for four to six weeks, so we should suspend this guy for, you know, five games. This guy over here made the exact same hit but the guy that he hit isn't injured at all he returned to the game so he gets nothing uh, in terms of supplemental discipline it just doesn't make any sense um so it should be black and white they have to find a way i know it's hard to make it like actually black and white but they have to find a way to make it more clear because it's just ridiculous right now it's getting out of hand um anyways uh that's pretty much all i had for today uh, so thanks for listening to this episode of what really grinds my gears uh the main takeaway should be that the department of players safety is a total shit show run by circus people and that the only solution for us uh the fans is total anarchy um so thank you all as always for tuning in today please don't forget to subscribe to our podcast if you haven't already uh, we are on apple spotify google podcasts uh, iHeartRadio, stitcher etc 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 and leave us a review as well if you feel so inclined uh, we always love to hear what our fans have to say until next time, Caps fans, stay classy and enjoy the game against the Florida Panthers on Wednesday night. Um, we'll see you back here next week. And as always, let's go Caps.